Hello. Thank you all for coming. I'm Brett Amory, and uh, this is my lecture. Um, I have a lot of slides, and it might go long, so if you guys are getting bored or tired, just let me know, and I'll speed it up. So I'm an artist living in East Oakland, out by the Coliseum. I lived in San Francisco, 97 until 2009, then moved to the East Bay to uh, get more space. Can't really have space if you live in the city. Um, I graduated from the academy in 2005. Took me 10 years to get through a four-year program. Um, I think I started out as a motion picture major, then illustration, or no, animation, then illustration, then fine art. Um, Let's see, I, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't grow up making art, or I, I did early on, and then I started skateboarding when I was about 10, and that took um, control over my life. Um, from, from 10 to about 21, it was skateboarding and uh, playing music. And then when I moved out, I moved out here to study film because I uh, always had a video camera and I, I would shoot my friends. Um, Film my friends skateboarding and snowboarding, whatever. And I, I sort of fell into art when I got here. The people I, were, I was skateboarding with and playing music with were artists themselves and inspired me to start um, trying it. Um, I wasn't that good in the beginning. You know, I, I failed my first analysis of form class, took it again, I must failed it twice. Um, when I switched over to animation, I had to uh, animation students have to take figure drawing classes, and I remember my, my teacher pulled me aside one day and told me I was the worst student in the class and I had to go to workshops. And um, that was what changed everything. So I started going to one, one workshop a week, then two, then three. Um, I don't know if this is the same now, but the workshops when I was in, like from 97 to about 2004, the workshops were happening. You know, that, that was where all the most serious students were at. And there was a, a certain bar that um, was placed in the workshops. Um, so I started going to them once a week, twice a week, three times a week, then every day. And once I started going every day, I started enjoying it. And once I started enjoying it, I, got, I started getting better at drawing. And um, I did that for about three years, just every day in the workshops. And then when I turned 24, I started painting. Um, painting was, uh, drawing was a real uh, struggle for me, and it still is, but painting came a little bit um, more naturally. I think it's because it worked with form rather than line. Um, so I gravitated towards painting more so than drawing and um, switched over to fine art. So if, if, if people know who I am, um, know my work, they know me for the waiting series. The waiting series, I started in 2001 when I was, um, I quit going to school for a year because I was wor working in Emeryville um, at a, a software company doing help desk, IT, basic IT stuff. And when I was commuting back and forth by bar and uh, train or bus, I noticed there was a disconnect uh, amongst the commuters. So I started a series based on that disconnect. And it wasn't really nothing more than that. It was just paintings about waiting to be somewhere else, people in transit. Um, so that was in 2001. And I started that series while I was taking a hiatus from the academy. I got laid off. It took me six months to get an uh, interview. I uh, had a second interview. Then I, I missed it because someone jumped on the BART tracks, held the train, it was right around 9-11. Uh, so I missed my second interview, and that day I decided to re-enroll back at the academy, and that was in 2003, I believe. Um, and when I re-enrolled, re it was, um, I re-enrolled as a fine art major, painting. This is just the start of um, the waiting series. I uh, ended it last year. I did about 300 or so, give or take. Um, paintings within that series. 
Um, and I'll talk about a few other series that are, that are ongoing. Um, when I was in school, I wasn't a, afraid to experiment and explore, and I encourage you all to do that. That's why you're, why you're here. Um, so I messed around with um, different mediums, resin, panel paintings, similar to David Hockney's uh, uh, montage, photo montages. Um, I've, I've been working on another series uh, from Passport Photos, Founder Discarded Passports, and I'm, that, that series is ongoing. But the, the purpose of, sh of talking about these series is each one evolves into the next, and they all sort of merge together. Uh, they're separate series, but I kind of look at them as being one thing. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go through. I have a few slides from uh, the early waiting paintings, and then, uh, yeah. So this, I still have this painting, but this, it's a bad image of it because it's, it's, it's covered in plastic. But this is like waiting number three. This is, um, I think it's Howe Street Bart. The early waiting paintings were, um, I didn't stray too, too far away from the photograph. It was a uh, sort of impressionistic approach to realism, if you want to call it that. And it was very influenced by what I was learning here. This is a couple years forward. This is probably like waiting number seven or something. I think that's Civic Center Bart. And then I, I was trying, uh, just playing around with like monochromatic palette. And so around 2004, I started, I was working at Kinko's. And Kinko's was where I did a lot of my experimentation and tried out new mediums and different ideas and just had a lot of fun um, experimenting with their machines. Um, while I was there, I started a series um, from found or discarded passports. And in the beginning, they were um, small and kind of cute, kind of like little characters. These are, these are about four inches by three inches. I was doing small work because before this series, I was working on another series um, that I called the panel series. And it was similar to David Hockney's photo montages where I would take a bunch of photographs and then stitch them together and then paint each each photograph separately and then put it back together as one painting and paint it as one painting. Those paintings would take me months and months to finish and I was in school and working. So I started this series which was the paintings are very quick and there's not a lot of thought and they're fun. So um, it was a way for me to step outside of myself and get back to the enjoyment of the process. Um, a few years later, they evolved and they got bigger. Um, and I started making up names for the people that I was painting. I was looking at these, these passport pictures, not knowing who they were, but when you spend hours and hours looking at somebody you don't know, your mind starts to create these pers personalities and these personas about these people. So I started naming them. And these, are, um, these are about five and a half by six inches. They got a little bit bigger. From 2001 to 2007, I was doing the waiting series. I was playing around with resin. Um, the same way you, you put together a Photoshop image with resin, I mean, with layers, I was doing these resin pieces in similar sort of uh, format process. So I would print out transparencies of a Photoshop images, image with a bunch of layers and then build these re resin cubes. Um, and then after doing that for a few years, uh, the resin is really bad for you. So uh, I stopped working on the resin. And I, I was also working on the panel series. I was working on the, the, the passport series. And I was playing and experimenting a lot of Kinko's and the tools that they had. They're, they're different machines. Um, so I graduated in 2005. In 2007, I had a serious look at my work. So my website had resin work, it had panel paintings, it had passport paintings, it had waiting paintings, it had still lifes, it had cityscapes, it had all, all this stuff. So I was very lucky in a sense that it took me 10 years to get through school. Um, I wasn't lucky because it took so long, but I was lucky that where I met a lot of people in different, a couple different generations that had come out and go into the art world and make art as for a living. So I had a lot of good examples to lead by. 
Um, so I was looking at my friends that are already uh, somewhat established artists and seeing what worked for them. And I realized in 2007 that the, the guys that were showing in galleries and selling work were the ones that had a, a cohesive body of work and they had a thing that identified themselves to what they do. So I stripped everything off my website except for waiting. waiting the waiting series was the only series that really held my interest throughout the years. You know, I would, I would work on some waiting paintings and then I would stop and I'd do something else and then I'd come back to it and, and do it again. And that happened from 2001 to 2007. So in 2007 I decided to brand myself. Now that's, that's, a, that's kind of a bad word to use amongst artists, but it's, it's the reality of the business that we're in because if you don't treat it like a business then you're going to struggle. And you're going to struggle anyway. But the more you treat it like a business, the better off you're going to be. Um, so I branded myself with waiting. I wanted people to see someone on the, on the, on the um, <clears throat> excuse me, on a bus stop sitting there waiting and thinking of, of me and my work. So I stripped everything off my website, and that's the only thing I had on there. But w when I came back to the series, the, co the concept had changed over the years. So it wasn't no longer about waiting to be from point A to point B. But what happens while we wait? We anticipate the, the future, we think about the past, but we're not really in the present moment. We're not in the now, we're not in the here. So the work became about what's happening while we wait. What's, what's our mind doing? Are we conscious? Are we unconscious? Um, so I thought the best way to do that, to illustrate that idea, was to strip out the environment and just have a, a one, one subject so the viewer is forced to fo focus on the feeling of the painting first, and then the content. I want I wanted the viewer to feel the work rather than see the work. The work, you know, I started stripping out the environment and just really dialing it into like uh, the essential elements. It's about her and what she's doing and where she's at. Plain and simple. Simplifying the concept and simplifying the, the paintings. And I was also interested in movement. That, that came from the panel series. Um, a lot like the, when I came back to the waiting series, I started incorporating different ideas that I did in the other series. Again, it's, it's all it's all one thing because I'm just I'm who I am, and you're who you are. So whatever you do as an artist um, through experimentation and exploration, it's you. You know, so like, I think the important thing is is to be conscious of what you're doing and why you're doing it, and let those things merge together, um, and not and not not fear of letting go of certain things and moving forward. So these next few slides, um, for, from 2007 to about 2010, the work was primarily high key. It's a lot of a lot of negative space, a lot of white. Um, and you can say they're all daytime paintings. When I went to school here, I learned everything that I know up until 2005 from the academy. I didn't know about contemporary art. I didn't. Or I knew about contemporary like studio art and fine art, but I didn't know about like contemporary art or lowbrow art or uh, street art. So when I got out of school, I, st I started um, hanging out with different types of artists, different di artists and different doing different types of art. And, and some of those artists were street artists. So waiters, they started out on the street. So I had an idea of, I wanted to depict these people that were, I, I was put into the waiting paintings, the landscapes, because um, the people that I chose to put into these paintings were usually overlooked in society. Um, so I wanted to paint them on a monumental scale and put them back on the street of where, wherever I took their picture so the viewer is forced to give them attention. So they started out as uh, original oil paintings and latex on, on butcher paper and now to go back and put them on the street where I took their picture. And these are all about, um, they range in size from seven to 10 feet. So I, I, it was a very short spurt of street art for me. Um, I realized I'll spend a lot of time on these butcher paintings, butcher paper paintings, and they would be, uh, they'd be up for a couple days and then tore down. So I started doing them on canvas. So these are the first two I did on canvas. 
and I stopped doing street art. I, I, I never really called myself a street artist. I just kind of did it because uh, I was hanging out with different street artists and it seemed like it was fun. And it was fun, you know, going out and uh, late at night and putting stuff up illegally. You know, it's like, I felt like I was a kid again, breaking out of the house. Um, and then, so I did the large figures for a little while, and then I started doing them really small. And these are about four by uh, five and a half inches or so. And I did hundreds of these. And then I was still doing the waiting series. Uh, the, the waiters and the waiting series are, the, the waiters is, is somewhat of a uh, sub-series within the waiting series. And all these places are, this is Oakland, um, some places are San Francisco, a lot of it is where I'm living at the time. You know, I'm inspired by my environment. And that's what I choose to paint. And the work, you can, you can see the work is, is, is slowly starting to um, evolve into something else. It's getting a little bit more abstract. Um, I'm slowly detaching myself from um, academia or technique. So around 2010, I decided to do a shift and I'd start doing these night paintings. And this is the same idea, a lot of negative space, but instead of white, I was using black. And these, these if, if I really wanted to make a good living as an artist, I could, I could do prime, I could just do these dark paintings. I'd probably be financially okay. Um, these paintings sell quicker than anything else I've ever done. Um, so around 2012, um, I had a show in Newcastle, England, and it was right around the time I got my first iPhone. These paintings were all in the show in England, um, and the show was about technology and how, how it transforms our lives. Before, I would have to, when I, had a, when I would have shows, I'd have to go out um, with a camera, a point and shoot, with an with a idea in mind and take pictures. Now that I had an iPhone in my pocket at all times, I was able to capture my day-to-day -day, um, life or um, just what happens on a day-to-day -day basis um, every day. So this show was based on the iPhone and, and how it changes our, our lives and um, adds to our lives, I guess. But the work uh, became more abstract and, and closer to the subject because I was able to um, take candid photographs without people knowing what I was doing. In 2012, I started another series within the waiting series, which was called 24, and the idea is to go to a city and spend a month there and document 24 places that represent neighborhoods, um, places that are historical and like iconic landmarks. Um, the first place I did was San Francisco, because I live here. Um, but the idea is, was to give the viewer an overall experience of the city that they live in. And I started incorporating photography, video, installation, found objects, and, and painting. Um, once I found a, a, I would do a lot of, re like first I, I would use social media. If I went to a different city, I'd use social media. I would reach out to like, send out a, a message on Facebook or Instagram. I don't think Instagram was back then, but. Um, and to say, I'm, I'm in your city for one month. If you know any places that represent neighborhoods, please let me know. And then people would start commenting and tell me to go check out different places. And I'd also do a lot of reading and research, read historical books about the place that I was at. Um, so I would go to these places that I had in mind or pe people would suggest, and I'd go to them different times of the day to see like what, what time of day best suits the place. Um, once I found the place that fit the series, I would assign an hour out of the day to it and then go back for the assigned hour and set up a, a video camera and shoot for that hour, shoot a video. While I was shooting a video for the hour, I'd collect stuff on the ground, found objects, ephemera, and that is sort of the DNA of the place. It tells you who's in the area, who lives there, who's going to this place. Um, and I'd also take pictures with my iPhone and my point and shoot while I was at that place for, for the assigned hour. Um, after I got it, gathered all the information, um, usually take, you know, like 48 hours of video and, and narrow it down to 24 places. I would have a friend of mine um, put all the videos together on one frame. So all the videos are playing simultaneously and it makes a complete day in that city. So it'd be 
12 to 1 a.m., 1 to 2, 2 to 3, all throughout the day, 24 hours, all playing at the same time, 24 different places. And then I, I would, in the beginning, I would choose half to make paintings of. So half of the places I would turn into paintings, and I would take the stuff that I collected at the place and put it in a pedestal underneath the place, and that, underneath the painting, and that sort of puts the painting in context. It tells you, like, the stuff that I collected, like, say, like, in the mission, if I document the stuff at the mission, is it going to be, the stuff that I collected there is going to be different than the stuff I collect in Chinatown. So it gives the viewer an idea of who's in the place, who lives there, and it puts the painting in a, a certain context. And this is the press release from the first show that was at Sandra Lee Gallery um, on Post Street. She's no longer there. And this series is still part of the waiting series. Um, I would title the paintings, the name of the place, the hour of the day, and then waiting with a number. And Sean Roberts also went to school here, but he studied uh, new medium. He's an amazing photographer, videographer, multimedia guy. Um, so this shows you the painting and then the stuff that was collected underneath here. And these are all San Francisco locations. <laughs> so this, I only painted um, 12 of the locations, and I think six of the locations for the first show had stuff underneath. And so the, the rest of the stuff that I collected was put in, was placed into this display case. So this here is a map of San Francisco, and this is a legend here. And each one of these little colored pens represents where it is. So it tells you the name of the place, and then it shows you where it's at. And then the, there's a number that corresponds with the stuff that was collected at that particular location. And then the iPad had uh, the photography that I would take at each location while I was there shooting video. Um, usually when I do the 24 shows, I'll, I'll go to a city and spend a month and document, and I'll take anywhere from five to 10,000 photographs while I'm there. Um, and usually what, what I was doing was putting the photographs on an iPod, like uh, 200 of the best ones, and those were on rotation throughout the show. I don't ha I, I forgot to include the, um, a picture, but there's, um, picture of the little waiters here kind of gives you an idea of scale so I'll still incorporating those into the shows and this is a still shot of the um, the video that was playing all at the same time so it started out uh, 12 to 1 a.m. 1 to 2 2 to 3 that's like a Faro theater Stockton tunnel last exit of uh, San Francisco tower Tower Theater, I believe. This is Eddie and Jones. A friend of mine was killed skateboarding there. Bob's Donuts. Um, what is that? Oh, Mission, uh, I mean, uh, Yerba Buena Park. That's where we claimed San Francisco from Mexico, I believe. And it's also where the first school in California was erected. Uh, what is that? Headquarters for the Chinese Six. Mission Day Isis, the oldest church in San Francisco. Some random Vietnamese spot. This is... Um, Fifth or seventh in market. Now it's a big shopping center that they're about to open. Uh, Battery Street used to be the old shoreline. City Light Books, The Mint, Glide Church, Chronicle. I don't know what that one is. This was uh, when they were still collecting money at the toll booth at uh, Golden Gate Bridge. This is the toll collectors. Uh, Hate Ashbury, some random spot. Whiz Burger, Valet Parking, because I think it's going to disappear eventually. Hulk and Sutter, I used to live there, and Castro Theater. So the anonymous series, the Passport series, I changed the name. The, in the beginning, it was called Passport Buddies, when they were kind of cute. And then I, in 2013, I came back to the series. I had taken a break from it for a few years, and I changed the series name to Anonymous. And the paintings got much larger and darker, more cynical. And these are still, th these are also from passport photographs.
So this was uh, 24 New York, which happened in 2013. Um, this part of 24 series, obviously. This for this so the, the 24 each 24 series shows I was doing would be an evolution of the one before. So for this particular one in New York, I, it was the first time I did an installation that um, supported painting. So Bleaker Bob's, I was, I was there in March 2013, and the show was in July of 2013. And Bleaker Bob's is a, is a uh, record store in the West Village, and it was there for 40 years. I mean, it was, it was kind of like a uh, landmark record store. Uh, when I came back in July for the show, it was replaced by a frozen yogurt. Um, so th this started happening more and more as I'd go to these cities and document. I'd come back for the show, and some of these places that were iconic to certain, represented certain neighborhoods were, were disappearing. And being that we're in San Francisco, I'm sure you're, you're all aware of that and see it. I mean, it's happening here on a month to month basis. And you know, these shows is that's part of the concept for these shows is, is to document these places that are on the brink of extinction and places that are add color to neighborhoods and represent neighborhoods and are iconic and landmarks and um, places that you ate when you were a kid or record stores you shopped at when you were young and um, places that really define uh, neighborhoods and community um, are disappearing at alarming rate, especially in cities like San Francisco, New York, London. This show will also incorporate in sound insulation. Um, so this particular painting, this was in Chinatown, Manhattan, and the radio was playing um, the Cantonese radio station, just so you can get like put the painting in a uh, visual context and also uh, uh, audio, you know, just activate it more senses. And then this is the this was a bodega in Jamaica, Queens. And this is the first insulation that I ever did. Um, but it's, it's not pure insulation. It's, when I first started doing insulations, they were sort of uh, elaborate frames that supported painting. And I had an awning up there, but you can't see it. So uh, do you all know Lucian Shapiro, by chance? He went to school here, too. He's a, uh, he does performance art and sculpture, sculpture. But we drove the work out to New York together. Um, and every state that we went through, we uh, stopped and got a, a, a newspaper and a magazine. So all the, the magazines are all hand painted, the covers, but they're from every state that we went through, along with the newspapers. Each city that I documented, so I started here in San Francisco and I, um, I had never uh, taken a video camera and put it in front of someone's business before. So I quickly realized that people don't like having their place of business uh, videotape. Um, people uh, got pretty confrontational quick. But I, I just kind of held my ground and, and did it because I would be across the street and it's public property. Um, technically, they couldn't really stop me from doing what I was doing, so I just did it. When I went to New York, the mentality from West Coast to East Coast is a little bit different. So the second day I was in um, Little Italy documenting this cafe, and a half hour into it, the owner comes out with a monkey wrench and uh, yeah, threatened to beat my ass. So I, uh, I, I, I figured out different ways, um, more stealth tactics to document these places. So I got a bike, uh, rented, or I bought a bike, and I put a, I got a fanny pack, and I cut a hole in it, and put the camera inside the fanny pack, and I would lock the bike up in front of the place that I was documenting. But after about 20 minutes being there, people start to wonder why you're just standing around. They think you're casing the place. Um, so it's kind of uncomfortable and awkward sitting there for an hour at a time. People start to notice you. And I did the same thing when I was in, in London. I just, I used the bike. Uh, technique. When I documented for 24 Los Angeles, the show was canceled, so I, I, I still haven't had the show. Um, I came up with a different idea, which has worked. It worked great. And it's, um, I bought a um, survey camera, 
and I gutted it out and I put the camera inside that and then I got a construction outfit. And that was, uh, people didn't even question it. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, and I had a, a collector of mine, he came up from San Diego and he went to, a, he hung out with me for about a week and he was dressed in outfit too. And uh, <laughs> we would have a camera documenting us because at that point it kind of becomes almost like a, perform a f performative piece. Um, so we'd have a camera document and us, and then we'd have the, another camera inside the uh, the survey camera machine. And um, you know, people would ask us what we were doing. Like, oh yeah, we're surveying. And like, what are you surveying? The land mass. Oh like, yeah. What's, what's that thing do? It's like, oh, that's a uh, sends up these signals to satellites and triggers back down to the survey. So you can basically tell people whatever, but if you if you look like you're, you're legit and you're supposed to be there, people just accept it. So this is London Tube, the red line. So there's a map above it that shows the, the line. And then these are, I, I recorded video and also sound with this piece. So you can hear the uh, hour of the train. Like I rode the train line from uh, you know, beginning to end and then recorded uh, the sound. And then these are all the different like uh, oyster cards and different uh, passes that I collected throughout the month while I was there. And then this this is where I stayed at. I stayed in um, where did I stay over by Brick Lane. Um, and there are a lot of kids in the building that I stayed in. And every day they would um, play in this courtyard, and the elders would go out there and watch them. And I'd usually be out all night documenting. So they, they'd always wake me up around 2 o'clock. Um, so the, the, the headphones, you can hear the kids playing. And then these are toys and stuff that they kind of left around the premises, just discarded toys. And these are, this is like a, a clothesline. Um, that, that's how they were drying their clothes. And then this particular piece... Um, so in the 40s, when we were at war, London was being bombed. So there's a train station called Bethnal Green. And I think it was 1943, they sounded the alarm, so it was a test. But people didn't know it was a test, and they flipped out. And they ran down into the train station and panicked. And um, hundreds of people just started running, and a, a little girl tripped. And I think 80 women and children died, trampled to death. So this is a memorial for that, for what happened. Um, I was out there in, I think, also March documenting, and then I went back in July for the show. And when I went back, they were building a memorial, but they had to stop. They didn't complete it because they ran out of funding. So the gallery, they, they, they have a print shop. We decided to do a um, 24 by 60 inch gold leaf, or 28 karat gold leaf print of this painting and auctioned it off and we gave the proceeds to, um, to help them finish the memorial. This is like a smaller installation. And then this is a, uh, a newsstand. These are portraits of people that I, I saw when I was in London but they're sort of similar. They're, it's the progression into the anonymous series. They're not from passport photographs, but doing these um, portraits and, and kind of in an abstract approach <coughs> kind of transitioned me later for the anonymous series. That's the direction the anonymous series goes in. And then this guy was at Ridley Market. Um, so I went back when I was there and I bought all this stuff from him. <coughs> I just hung it on the outside of the painting. And some of it's painting and some of it's actual object. And it's kind of, it's kind of a nod to like Tom, uh, Thomas Wesselman and um, some, of the, uh, some of the pop artists. So this is real brick, and then this is faux brick. <coughs> we <coughs> filled these gaps for the insulation that's sitting next to it. So um, and that was kind of part of the insulation. This here, I don't think I have a picture of it, but 
there's more of these portraits on this. This is a printout mounted to wood <coughs> cradle. And it's a, um, it's a place in Hackney, it's a council house. So when I was out there documenting, I was in Hackney riding, riding my bike and I saw this house with all these gigantic portraits covering their windows. So I went back and started doing research and I, I realized it's a, it's a project called I Am Here. So what happened, this particular area of Hackney is, is facing um, gentrification. So this particular council house management stopped taking care of the building and they stopped taking care of the tenants and um, they were trying to get people to move out or force them out so they could tear it down and build condominiums and this artist that lives there started the project called I Am Here and she made a documentary and um, the documentary had to stop again halfway through production because they, they ran out of funding so I got in touch with them and I, I wanted to donate the proceeds if the painting sold to help them finish their, their project, but the painting didn't sell. But if you guys are interested, if you just Google I Am Here, it's, it's really interesting. It's a great documentary. Um, and they're, they're all, they all actually got kicked out of the, the house, the council house, the project. Um, but it's a really, really cool story. So around 2014, I started doing more installations, uh, but they're still, they still incorporated painting. They weren't pure installations yet. This is a recreation of Bob's Donuts on uh, Polk Street. Donuts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's when I documented it. It was four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. This guy's on. Um, he's still there, Leavenworth, and uh, I think he's in between Geary and Post, maybe. He's been there, I think, since the '60s. He's, he's, he's in there every day, sitting there. And then this was, this was supposed to be part of 24 Los Angeles, but the show was canceled. Um, I had this piece at Barnsdale Park for the juxtaposed uh, 20 or 30 year anniversary, and it's part of Robert Williams' retrospective. But this is a motel that I documented across the street from Hollywood High. It's this really creepy place that doesn't belong where it belongs. Like it's kind of just sticks out. It looks like something out of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So when I when I was in LA document, I was I was just driving around trying to find places, and I came across this place and asked the owner if I could rent a room, and he wouldn't let me rent a room. He's like weird, weird people. And uh, so I, I came back the following week and asked if I could rent a room again. He's like, he kind of laughed at me. He said, no, we don't have any rooms available. So I waited and came back another time and uh, about three days later and I got a room. And the place was so creepy, I wouldn't stay there. I mean, it was, it was scary. So I called my collector that lives in San Diego. He's the same guy that was driving around with me for a few weeks documenting these places and I asked if he knew any models that would be willing to do a photo shoot. And he, we were going to get this guy, a buddy of his, he's a, a lot of problems. Um, but he was unavailable, so Johnny drove up that night. And we did a photo, I did a photo shoot with him. Um, that's him. That's him sitting on the bed. But the place is just, it's, uh, when he got there, he was just like, man, this place is like, you can just feel it. It's just some weird residual energy that's kind of. The sign really made the insulation. Um, the M and the O are on, so the motel is on two different transformers. The M and the O are on a Dian transformer, so it blinks. And then I downloaded the sound of static, so you can hear the sign. Zzzz. So the, the sound and the blinking light make the, set the mood for the piece. I mean, it makes the piece completely. And then th this was at Art Market a couple years ago, 2014. So I came back to the Anonymous series in 2015, and the idea kind of changed a little bit. I was, um, before I was sort of doing these character-based paintings of these, these passport photographs, and when I came back to the series, um, the work got more abstract, and it was, it was about uh, capturing the person's presence rather than the, the way they look. They're um, 
identity. And they're all really small. And I, I did hundreds of them. This, is, this was one, one piece. And they're, all, they're all about, uh, I think, four by five and a half inches. Or four and a half by five inches. So 2015, I did a show in New York um, based on gentrification of the Lower East Side and the disappearance of the mom and pop family run business. That was the first show where I did primarily all the work was, was reading. So I read, I started reading in January and um, read about seven books from January to um, May. And then I went out there in May and took about 10,000 pictures in 10 days. Um, and I spent six weeks working. I spent most of, most of the year reading and developing ideas and figuring out the, the, his, the historical relevance of the area for that particular time, and 20% executing. Um, but by the time I got to New York, I, I knew exactly what I wanted, because you know, I had done so much research. So yeah, it was a, it's about what happened in New York in the 80s, which is pretty close to what's happening here now in Oakland. So some of the paintings I would take places how they used to look that no longer exists and incorporate them into how they look now. So CBGBs, you know, back in you know the 80s, 90s, you probably wouldn't be walking around with kids in this part of New York. You know, it was a CD. It was pretty seedy back then. But now it's, you know, it's, it's really safe. There's condominiums. There's a John Barbato's where CBGB's is now. There's a, I think there's a, uh, some kind of bank right there. Um, so it's really transformed. It's changed dramatically. And now this area, Lower East Side, East Village, Lower East Side in particular is becoming the new Chelsea because galleries can no longer afford rents in Chelsea. You know, last I heard, Starbucks can't even afford rent in Chelsea. So. The Lower East Side is becoming the new Chelsea. And before Chelsea, it was Soho. You know, so it's, it's um, you know, before artists were living in the East Village and Lower East Side, they were living in Soho because it was a meatpacking district. And no one really wanted to live there, so artists were living there in these big spaces. And then the place gentrified and everyone moved out to the Lower East Side and the East Village, where it was very affordable. And it created this, this place of creativity. People from all over the world were moving there. And that's, you know, the 80s and Lower East Side, there's so much great music and great art came out of that one area. You know, it's because it was affordable for artists to be there. Same with the uh, Mars Bar. This was on, um, was it Second Ave and Third? Uh, Mars Bar was a, uh, was a was a staple for a lot of, you know, Mars Bar and CBGBs for a lot of early bands and Blondie, Talking Heads, Ramones. Uh, it's where like, uh, you know, Keith Haring and Basquiat and a lot of these early uh, street artists were hanging out. Warhol. Kenny Scharf. Some of these places still exist, but they're all on the brink of extinction. You know, they could all disappear any, any, any time. This place is in the East Village, and it's still there, and it's, it's, it's a very important place for performance, spoken word, literature. This place, when I was out there, this was a bank that was, was uh, shut down for a long time, and I think for this uh, finance guy bought it. But when I was out there for the show, Vito Schnabel had curated a, a, a show in there. And it was like this, it was this very highbrow show. It was pretty amazing. Um, and what I heard after the show came, uh, after the show was over, they tore it down. It's right near the new museum over Lower East Side, Rivington area. This is where I got chased off, this, this spot here. <laughs> well, I was on the other side. And some of this work is going back to the, the uh, waiting series in uh, like 2007, 2009. A lot of negative space. Late 70s and 80s, you couldn't really give these buildings away. 
So there's a lot of abandoned buildings and people were squatting in them. So the city passed a law, a homesteading law stating, if you're squatting in one of these buildings and you've proved that you can, you can afford the insurance and you, you can make improvements on the building, we'll sell it back to you for a dollar. So these people start buying these buildings for a dollar because they, they couldn't give them away back then. It was just, it was an apocalyptic landscape. So this is one of the last remaining squats from those days that they, I think they bought through the homesteading law. That's the oldest uh, Guinness bakery in New York. New York Dolls have one of their album covers in front of this, if you guys like them. It's kind of... So when I had the show, Jonathan had uh, gotten a second space. And when he moved in, they started doing construction in front of the, the gallery. Um, but it worked to my uh, benefit. So if you look at the front window, these are all land developer signs that I took um, when I was in New York documenting. So I plastered the front window of the gallery with all these different places that are being built. And then this is construction that is actually happening in front of the gallery. It worked perfectly because the next slide you'll see like I built a construction wall not knowing that the construction was out there when you first walk in. So the, we opened the doors during the opening and it looked like the installation just kind of continued. So this wall here, when I was in New York documenting, um, a week before I got there, a building blew up on 7th Avenue. And it blew up because the owner was tapping into a legal gas line uh, with their neighbor downstairs. Um, so this piece is, is sort of a memorial for, for a lot of people. Uh, a couple people died and a lot of people were displaced. So this is, serves as a memorial for the people that were, lost their lives and um, lost their housing. And then here, I don't think I have, I don't know if I have another picture, but if you look inside this little diamond here, there's a diorama of the, uh, the empty lot of the building that blew up. There's like a little dump truck and there's like a, the uh, surrounding perimeter of the, the, the uh, existing walls around it. And then these are old uh, flyers from shows at CBGB's and the Mars Bar and the Mud Club. Uh, 2015, I had a show, I was in a group show at Fort Wayne Museum. And this is, I made this installation for it. The installation is about the disappearance of the mom and pop family run business. And it's sort of like a, a life size diorama, the interior. Um, 2015, this is in January. I, I ended the waiting series and I decided to try to take the work in a different direction. Um, and this is the first attempt at that. And this is a show I had at, at Lazaridis Gallery in London last, last June. And it's the first body of work outside of uh, first departure from waiting. This is, this is not part of the waiting series. And the work's getting flatter. Um, it's more of a nod to mod early modernism. This show, I just, this is my first museum show I had it last November. It just came down two weeks ago. And this is the first time that <coughs> I incorporated a, a full installation without, uh, without painting. So this is a 32 foot wide installation. Um, parts of it are are uh, historical references to Fort Wayne and the history of Fort Wayne, and parts of it are uh, uh, conversation about the po political climate and what's happening in our country right now. Fort Wayne was voted All-American City like three different times, and it's sort of the crossroads of America. Um, so this part of the installation is <coughs> is sort of about 
what does all American city look like? What does make, make America great look like? Um, who is a great for? So it's, it's sort of a uh, conversation about some of those topics. And this guy here, he's one of the big portraits that I painted. Um, when I was there, part of the show was I wanted to reach out to local businesses and get them involved somehow. So one of the businesses is a, was a nonprofit called Blue Jacket, and they do outreach for veterans and um, ex-cons. So when these people get out of the prison or, or the military, they help these people get back on their feet. They, they prepare them for um, interviews, give them clothes to wear. So we went there and told them that I wanted to uh, get them involved somehow. So I met three, of their, three people that went through their program and interviewed them and took pictures of them. Um, this guy here, he's known as Scary Jerry in Fort Wayne. He's about, he's like, he's almost seven foot tall. He is kind of scary looking. Um, but there's a Facebook page on him. So when people see him around Fort Wayne, they update the page. She's like, oh, so we spotted Scary Jerry here. You know, like, so like people are scared of him. Um, the people at Fort Wayne, at, at the Blue Jacket, that's all they told us. You know, so I felt bad for the guy. Um, so I put him in this painting, and the, the drawing, this monster thing, is a drawing from, the museum has a learning center, and kids go in there and draw. So a lot of the drawings that are incorporated in one of the other paintings come from the kids, and that's one of the monster drawings that one of the kids drew. Um, and all this other stuff are just different uh, tags around the city, but the painting is primarily about, about him and how he's perceived in Fort Wayne. And then when you, when you put the headphones on, you hear the sounds of the train. This painting is about, there's these, uh, these uh, veterans that picket every third Saturday in front of the courthouse and they protest the war. So this is about you know, what they stand for and what they protest. Later on, I didn't, my photographs were limited. Um, these are, uh, I made a bunch of poppy plant flowers. That's the flower of remembrance. And then a friend of mine, he's been helping me with the last four years. He writes stuff for me. He wrote this little um, statement, extended label that, that went with the painting to sort of put it in a, another context. These portraits here, I was there for a month. We spent about two and a half weeks installing. And then we had the reception, the opening. And I had two weeks left and didn't really know what to do, so I decided to, um, I had to be present in the museum every day. And it was, it was uh, open to the public, so the public interaction was part of my residency. Um, I came up with the idea to, to take pictures of people, passport format, and do all these, to do portraits of them. So there's uh, 300 portraits of people that came and visited me while I was at the museum. And they're all done sort of uh, anonymous style. This painting here, so have you all heard of the Internet Archive? Anybody? Internet Archive is based in San Francisco, but they have five different locations around the country. And one of those loca locations is, is in Fort Wayne in the basement of the library. And what they're doing is they're trying to archive all the books. So they're go they're, they have these stations set up similar to animation stations, 2D animation, where these books are laid out with cameras and the people are down there going page by page, taking digital images of these books. They're archiving all the books. And you can go to digital archive, I mean, internetarchive.org and download a, books for free. Um, so this painting is about the death of the book as we know it. It's about the Internet Archive. And then these are calling cards uh, from libraries. That I don't think we use those anymore. It's all digital now. Um, and then the frame is made out of the same cards. And there's, you know, there's different literary classics, Death of a Salesman, Hamlet, um, Homer, uh, Moby Dick, uh, Huck Finn, Great Gatsby. And then Fort Wayne is also known for their, they had the biggest Lincoln Foundation in the country. So when I was out there documenting, the curator of the museum, his girlfriend works at the, at the library, and she, and she got me a tour. And the woman gave me a tour of the Lincoln Foundation. It's in the vault of the library. 
in about three weeks, they have this, this photograph, there's a photograph where when, um, when Lincoln died, his, his wife grieved for him for years. So she went and saw all these spiritual advisors. And um, this one guy claimed that he could talk to the dead through his photographs. And back then, people didn't really, they weren't really educated on, the, on photography techniques. So uh, he took this picture of her, and above her is Lincoln, like a ghost, with his hands on her shoulder. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a double exposed picture. But she believed it, you know, like, because people didn't really know about the processes back then. And about a month later, I was in the city in San Francisco at my girlfriend's house, and we were watching one of those uh, mystery shows one Saturday morning. And the woman that gave me the tour at the library was on the show, and they were trying to debunk the photograph that she showed me. So I decided to include it in the painting. Um, because this painting is it's about the library, but it's also about the Internet Archive. Um, and one of the other things that I did was I did a portrait of, of Abraham Lincoln, um, sort of similar to the dark anonymous portraits. And I donated it to the foundation. And they, have the, they, they built me like a little shrine kind of thing in the, in the library. That's per, it's on permanent display, and it has like the painting, and then it has a picture of Lincoln and some other like memorabilia. And then this, this one here is, this is a painting about Fort Wayne Museum. And these drawings here are drawings from, that the kids did. And then um, these installations are part of their permanent collection that are around the yards of the museum. And then all the, all the drawings that I use for the painting are on the floor with some of the pictures of the kids that made them. And then this piece here, this is the uh, this is about the embassy in Fort Wayne, and the embassy is like a really famous theater. Like all kinds of people would, when they were touring across the country, would stop and perform there. So yeah, like Duke, uh, no, Louis Armstrong, Bob Hope, uh, Tony Bennett, uh, Duke Ellington, Bob Hope, Dorothy Day. So the place has been open like since the early I think 20s. But in the 70s, uh, they ran out of funding and they faced demolition. The, the significance of the place is they have a, a real pipe organ in there. And these people, um, these pipe organ enthusiasts, became guardians of this thing. Um, so I guess apparently there's not many pipe organs left in the country. So these people became super protective. They, they, they do maintenance on it monthly. Um, so when the building was facing demolition, the guardians of the pipe organ did a fundraiser and raised two hundred thousand dollars, and they saved the building a day before scheduled demolition. So, this guy here is called—he's Buddy Nolan, and he—he he was the the guardian. He's like the main guy that saved the building. The only reason why the embassy is still there is because of him. Um, so when you when you hear put the headphones on, you hear him playing the pipe organ. Um, and then the neon that wraps around it represents the marquee that's out front of the. Uh, the embassy. And then those are the, the, the waiters. And then, so these are the people that I painted that were at Blue Jacket. So they came by when I was in the museum. We took these pictures, and the next day I posted it to social media. And then the museum reposted it to their Twitter, their Instagram, and their Facebook. And within an hour, somebody posted, Is that scary, Jerry? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But the thing was, he goes, do you know about Scary Jerry? And then someone in the museum responded and said, he's a sex offender. He raped somebody. So it was an issue. Um, there was a lot of conversation about, should we take the painting down? Because we don't want to send out the wrong message. We didn't know. Um, so yeah, that happened. Um, so this is the last thing that I did in January, and it was here in San Francisco. It was a month-long residency at the De Jong Museum. Um, the idea was to uh, do an um, a installation that, that changes each week, four different installments, and it shows the process of gentrification, but in reverse order. So the first week was a condominium with a gym underneath. Um, you can't see it, but up here, there's some. This is some 
weed plants sticking up because I, I'm currently getting kicked out of my warehouse from uh, Harborside, which is the biggest marijuana dispensary in the country, and they're taking over all the industrial warehouses in Oakland. They're the new gentrifiers of East Oakland, um, which is ironic because it, they're supposed to be activists and they're supposed to be on our side, but they're, uh, they're coming in, and when Prop 64 was passed, legalization of marijuana, there's certain laws stating that if you can grow, you can grow it, but you have to do it in industrial zone areas. Industrial zone areas is where artists are at, because no one else really wants to be in those areas. Um, but they're coming over to, they're, they've already kicked me out, they're kicking out a lot of people, um, and it's happening. You know, it's, uh, they're the new gentrifiers. Um, I had the same installation that had a Fort Wayne on display because it's about gentrification. And then this wall back here was a timeline that shows the progress and evolution of the waiting series and the uh, anonymous series. So the second week, because uh, it's about gentrification to show the process, what happens to a city over the course of a few years, but con condensed down to a month. But it's in reverse order. So the second week was a construction wall that's been placed around the condominium before it's being built. And then I invite, I encourage the public to interact with the piece and draw to draw on it. And then the third, the third week was a boarded up mom and pop family run business that gets forced out due to uh, high rents or contracts leases ending. And this was this was the final day of the of the third week. So this is out there when. When this piece came into the museum, it was, it was really clean and white, but this is what the public did. So they're encouraged to interact and add to the piece because that represents community that's lost when gentrification happens to the city. And then the final week was a dedication to the ghost ship. And uh, I did uh, the same thing I did in Fort Wayne. I, I did portraits of museum visitors there's Drew right there. Yeah. Drew came through. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.